Photo News Monthly is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, especially patrons of our parent program, Daily Tech News Show. Get the ad-free version of this show and more. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Coming up on Photo News Monthly, Nikon says goodbye. Big sensors coming to phones and is firmware a beta test? This is the photography news for the month of July 2022 in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Travolino. And from north of the wall, I'm Anthony Lemos. You know, during the week, photography news sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, especially in the overall tech sector. So once a month, we shine the spotlight on it. We dig through the cracks. We pull out the little photo news that's growing in between the great slabs of concrete that is social networks and gadgets. So let's get started with a bit of photo news you might have missed. I like to say we raise the shutter on oh. the photo oh. news of the month. Okay. I, I'm more of a pinhole photo news guy, but that's okay. That, no, that makes sense. Nikon announced new APS-C ca- mirrorless camera aimed at vloggers, the Z30. Yes, I said Z30. This uses a 20.9 megapixel sensor, seemingly the same used in the Z50 and the ZFC, offers a flip-out display, and can record 4K 30 frames per second video using the entire width of the sensor for up to 125 minutes. It ships in mid-July for $710 for the body or... 850 with a kit lens. Mm. In fun lens news, Venus Optics announced the Alawa 10mm f4 cookie lens for APS-C mounts. It's a pancake-style rectilinear lens, which means it's not fisheye, basically. It offers an equivalent ultra-wide field of view of about 15 millimeters in a svelte 130 gram frame, so it shouldn't have a lot of uh, weight there. It's available now for $299. ArduCam announced a new 108 megapixel camera module designed for machine vision applications. It's diminutive, diminutive, oh, see, there you go. It's diminutive, it's small size means it can work well with single board computers like the Raspberry Pi, although it uses a standard USB 3.0 interface, so it'll work just about anywhere. It can shoot up to 1.3 frames per second at full resolution or up to 14 frames per second at 12 megapixels. It's available now for $399. This might seem high, but RGCam is aiming this as an affordable replacement to industrial cameras at a price that independent engineers can access. All right, now we head to space. NASA released the first images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope this month. The deep field photo seems to be getting a lot of attention given the unimaginable scope and clarity the image presents. The deep field shot took 12 and a half hours to capture. More significantly, it captured Glass Z13. You see, I said Z there properly. The oldest galaxy ever photographed. The light from the telescope shows the galaxy 300 to 400 million years after the Big Bang, meaning that it's now 13 and a half billion years old, give or take a couple hundred million. The telescope has already, though, paid a price for this Im- impressive imagery. NASA disclosed that a micro meteoroid struck one of the telescope's 18 hexagonal mirrors between May 22nd and May 24th. We're really just getting the details of this now, hence why it's in July. Tis, uh, this, co- <laughs> this caused a significant blemish in one area that caused significant uncorrectable change in the overall figure of that segment. NASA expects the overall impact on the telescope's mission to be small as the other mirrors remain unblemished and realigning the mirrors allows it to operate within performance limits. Just amazing. Researchers at Samsung Labs developed an improved neural head avatar technology called Mega portraits, essentially allowing them to apply the facial expressions and movements from a video of one face and apply it to a static image of another face. The team believes this is the first to achieve a megapixel resolution. Current limitations mean that it can only process frontal or near frontal views. Yeah, but you should check out the link uh, in the show notes. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. They have uh, like Angelina Jolie and I think uh, President Buchanan yeah, on it. It's, it's very bizarre. It's a little. It's 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 odd. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Amos, you know, what was the uh, the big news this week? Well, one of the big pieces of news this month was the Nikkei Asia reporting that Nikon will stop developing single lens reflex cameras altogether. Nikon had previously said they would not develop another flagship flagship DSLR after the D6, but this means no new DSLRs are coming at all. 
If you thought Nikon was already out of the DSLR market, you might have good reason. The D6 was the last model released in June of 2020. Nikon didn't confirm this report, but it said it will continue to produce, distribute, and support existing DSLR models, but had already told investors it planned to wind down its DSLR business by 2025. So, I mean, you know, don't worry. You can still get the D5600 in Target. Nikon first started producing film SLRs back in 1959. Yes, the venerable Nikon F. So 60 years uh, of uh, of that, I guess, design methodology, that type of camera, roughly. Right. Although, let's be honest, the, the film and digital decilers are worlds apart. <laughs> I mean, so Amos, Amos, I have to confess something. I have never shot a DS. I've never owned. I've shot one. I've never owned a DSLR. Really? So- I have, I have, I've, my entire digital life has been either point and shoots and I moved right to mirrorless. So, I mean, okay. as, as someone who I know has shot at a high level, uh, you know, pretty intense stuff, uh, a lot of sports and stuff like that with a DSLR. I mean, are you surprised by this? Uh, does this seem, does this seem too late, too early? Like, like, how do we read this from Nikon? I, not just from Nikon, but in the industry overall, because Canon and Sony, they're all doing the same things. They're, they're, none of them are really in the DSLR game anymore. And the thing is that with a mirrorless, there are fewer parts. There's fewer points of failure. And you're, you're getting one less thing between your image and, and your eye, not necessarily the image in the sensor, because you know, by definition, the mirror flips up out of the way. So the, the sensor is actually getting, you know, 100%. But when you're looking at it, you have a physical barrier between the, the, the thing that you're looking at through the lens and your eye. And some people always had a problem with that. Now people seem to have a problem with the mirrorless aspect because there's ever so slight lag in it, which I can't notice, but maybe my eyes just aren't very good. I think this is kind of the natural evolution and it's... It, the the timing of it would surprise me if they were announcing this right now, but as we just mentioned, the last model was a couple of years ago. So them discontinuing support for things like that, you know, not even discontinuing support, but not releasing more models with the the single lens reflex technology is kind of right where it seems to be in my mind. Yeah, and while the majority, you're right. Canon is not exactly coming out and saying, "Hey, we got a the Mark V or whatever, 5D Mark V coming out anytime soon." Uh, Pentax still says they're they're going to be doing Rico Pentax still says they're going to be doing DSLRs. They're not going uh, mirrorless yet. But my question to you, Amos, is is looking at it kind of from the outside, it seems like if we weren't depending on basically every kind of interchangeable lens camera to be a hybrid camera, essentially at this point, like video video killed the DSLR, right? Yeah, I uh, that's part of it because even the DSLRs were all flipping up the mirror in order to mm-hmm. capture directly to the uh to the sensor. Um I really just I I think this is they're starting to see the the smaller bodies that you can have when you don't have the mirror that needs to be, needs to flip up and you're getting the same, you know, you you can use that space cuz you you're reducing the amount of space required but you're not reducing the actual size of the body cuz you're using more of that space for heat sinks for different uh processors from you know larger buffer size things like that i just think that this is where it needs to go and especially with the with mechanical failures if it's one less thing that's going to get jostled and knocked out of place when i drop my camera in my bag in a hurry and grab another body with a different frame on, or a different lens on it it's just one less thing that they have to worry about and one less thing they have to engineer for. I, I do also think that there is a, uh, like, especially can, I mean, all the, all the people that have jumped over to mirror, all the companies seem to have recognized this is also an opportunity to kind of really push lens design in really interesting ways because you can get so much closer to the sensor or the fil- yeah. or whatever the plane uh, you can, you can really push the glass like super, super close in a way that you can't when you have a mirror box yep. right there with a DSLR. So I, you know, we're seeing like really interesting, like that, uh, that Canon 28 to 70 F2 we're seeing just like, like, uh, like a, a lot of innovation in terms of just sharper lenses, faster lenses in ways that I don't think would be practical. Like certainly, listen, they, these, these all have top notch optical engineers, but to put it in like a semi usable size, I know that 28 to 70 is a bit of a beast and it's ridiculously expensive, but like we, we've seen that there is a, there, there seems to be a market shift in uh, sharpness and, uh, and kind of lens uh, uh, capability as well, kind of with the ship to mirrorless too. 
I, I don't know if the lenses are driving the shift to the mirrorless form factor yeah, yeah. or if the mirrorless form factor is allowing the lenses, but it either way you look at it, it is a great time to refresh lens lines when you're shifting to a new, you know, uh, the mirrorless form factors. Sony has had great lenses for a while on their mirrorless bodies. Uh, Canon is using this as an opportunity to come out with the RF line of lenses, which one for one, if you match that with the older, you know, the, if you match an RF lens to an EF lens, almost unanimously, the RF lens has better optics and is giving better results. So, you know, I, I don't know that the two are necessarily linked, but they're at least linked by opportunity. And it, it's a great time. Real quick, for people that, is there any reason to choose, if you if you have X amount of dollars, you have a couple thousand dollars, you want to invest in a high-end camera system. Is there any reason to choose an SL, uh, like a DSLR at this point? Like battery life probably still is a big advantage. Um, if you apps, like if you're shooting, like I'm thinking like, uh, like super fast action where you apps, like you cannot have any lag, but it, like, it would have to be that, that would be like racing or something like that, where it's like so incredibly fast. I can't like other than the, the battery life is the big advantage, right? Uh, battery life is, is the big advantage. If you're getting into the market now and you're looking for a lens or a, a body, you're going to go mirrorless unless for, cause even the mirrorless models have physical shutters that can be actuated and, and used to combat things like rolling shutter and, you know, distortion in the, the soccer not, ball. Not that the Z9. Not the Z9. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can't see yeah. Shutterless. Shutterless is the future. Shutterless is the new mirrorless. Let's I, talk about that. I, they're, they're going to have to increase the speeds of the of breeding. <laughs> they're going to, uh, in order to eliminate the shutter entirely, you need a full frame sensor, uh, uh, capture. And that's, that's a tough ticket. It, well, it's a lot of more processing and a lot more bandwidth on, on the camera's bus and everything else. So it, it, I'm seeing, I'm saying that's the next, the next step, but it's not quite there right now. Even on the Z nine, it's just, it's not quite fully baked and, you know, iterative, pro iterative process will get there, but we're not quite there right now. So, well, one place we are is in a realm of increasingly bigger camera phone sensors. That's called a segue. You're Jesus. welcome. <laughs> We've seen phone makers trying to cram in larger sensors for a while. We can look all the way back to the Halcyon days when Nokia broke new ground with the almost one inch sensor in the Nokia PureView 808, a phone I still look for on eBay and probably would buy at the right price. Panasonic technically shipped a one inch sensor on a camera that happened to be an Android phone with the CM1 back in 2015. That was really just a, a camera with a clunky phone interface. But more recently, Sony has shipped the Xperia Pro 1 with the same stack sensor it uses in the RX100 uh, Mark 7, although the phone's lens actually crops into the sensor a little bit. So you can argue, is it really getting the advantage of one inch sensor? But this month, Sony announced the uh, first one inch smartphone camera sensor that's kind of native for smartphones, the 50 megapixel IMX989. It's designed to be used natively so you don't have to crop it. Uh, and, and they're working with uh, uh, phone makers to make that happen. The first one uh, being uh, Xiaomi that they are putting out. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I totally lost my place. <laughs> the first one's being Xiaomi that they are working with. Um, they are not the first to kind of announce uh, kind of these an these ambitious new uh, camera sensors. Uh, Samsung has its uh, large ISOCELL GN1 sensor, has a lot of impressive specs, hasn't actually shipped. Supposedly it's going to, but Xiaomi has it in their, uh, Xiaomi has the Sony one inch sensor now in their 12 S ultra flagship. It's a large sensor. It's able to uh, shoot uh, 12 megapixel pixel bend images. So it, gathers different pixels from that larger 50 megapixel down to 12. Uh, you can also shoot at full resolution, offers uh, offers optical image stabilization, and can shoot up to 8K 24P for the no one that needs that. The Verge reviewed the phone and found that in low light, it was able to retain more detail with less crushed blacks, and even against the 108 megapixel camera in the Samsung S22 produced sharper photos. But most of this was only viewable at 100% magnification, and the camera itself had some weird exposure decisions in mixed lighting. So, you know, Amos, it seems like if for most people, their phone is their photos are going on Instagram or to other phone screens. Uh, you know, you're sending it in messages and stuff like that. A lot of times down resed anyway when you send it. Uh, yes, this is an impressive technical accomplishment. Will we see other phone makers? go after bigger hardware or is this going to be continue to be a software focused kind of innovative arena for phones? The the problem with this that I see is you can have a one inch sensor, but what kind of lens do you have in front of it? What kind of optics do you have in front of it? 
something has to give. Either the phone has to be really thick, the sensor has to be underpowered, or the optics aren't going to hold up to what the sensor can can attain. Unless you want a really thick phone, you're not going to get. All, I, I guess I'm 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 tired of them trying to shove bigger cameras and bigger sensors into smaller phones. The the computational photography we have now is amazing. You know, like let's spend more time in that for the people that are just wanting to take pictures and leave the amazing optics optics and exceptional uh, uh, sensor sizes to the professional cameras or even the hobbyist cameras can have a much larger sensor than what you're going to pack into a phone. I'm I'm not of the mindset that you need all of this power in a phone because it's not going to go to the greatest of use and people are going to spend a lot of money on really, really fancy selfies. Yeah, and the other thing is that large sensors are good for low light. Like I'm sure this sensor – just is is going to be able to perform better at higher ISOs uh, than than you know your your typical well, I don't know like one one point five inch sensor or whatever the weird uh, right. fractions you have to use to to measure phone <laughs> sensors for tiny sensors. But one I, I've noticed this a lot with uh, with my iPhone is that because you're able it's so, the sensor is so small because the lens is so short. Phones are able to get away with like ridiculously s- slow shutter speeds, and with computational photography, they stack images dynamically. They can do that extremely quickly, and you can shoot at one fifteenth of a second. It looks kind of okay. Again, unless you punch in, then everything looks soft. But no one ever does that because you're just going to post it to Instagram. Right. But in a lot of ways, larger sensors have a lot of problems. Like if you're using the RX one hundred seven sensor, you know that's a stack sensor, super fast readout. If it doesn't have that fast of readout. Your video, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, can get a lot more squishy. Like that's why the iPhone and, and phones are able to do like 4K video before a lot of your pro end cameras could because the refresh rate, you can, you can refresh that sensor so much faster. Yep. You get less rolling shutter. Yeah. It's, it's sure it's softer. It's less detailed. Um, but there is a lot of computational overhead that comes along or, or like, like physical overhead yeah. that comes along with having that larger sensor. And you're not really going to be able to get any physical advantage to your point, you're going to have to have a super wide lens on there anyway. So you're not going to get any shallow depth of field unless you're using computational photography, which phones are already doing with right. much smaller sensors. Um, so yes, like as a, as a camera nerd, would I love it if an iPhone came with like a branded glass and a one inch <laughs> sensor? And I'd be like, yes, this is what I, this is what I want. But for, you know, I mean, at least in the States, Xiaomi devices aren't necessarily the easiest to procure. Um, so, and, and Sony ones basically have no market share here. So even if Sony, you know, uh, comes out, put this on their own phone, uh, good luck finding it anywhere. Yeah. The, uh, so I, I applaud the audacity of trying to shove large camera hardware into very thin phones. I just, you're, you're right. The, the glass situation, it just, I feel like it adds more problems than it's solving at this point. My my thing on this is if you want a 50 megapixel sensor, cool. If you want a <laughs> if you want a low light sensor, then don't give me 50 megapixels. Give me 12 meg- megapixels and give me uh, cells in that meg in, in that sensor that are four times as many microns across. They're going to gather more light. They're going to be able to do a lot more, and you're going to have a lot less overhead on the other hardware in there. And then the glass isn't going to be as particular because you're not trying to shove all those pixels in there. And, oh, by the way, you can use a 12 megapixel picture on Instagram, on Twitter, whatever else, uh, probably a lot easier than you can a 50 megapixel because your phone's going to have to compress it to get it to fit onto the platform anyway. So if you're going to have a big sensor, then at least give me bigger cells on that sensor that are going to gather more light and not have to, you know, crunch anything. It's just going to give me good data. And that's, that's where I'm at with it. They're, they're chasing numbers instead of chasing the positive effects of what they could do with it. I mean, to be fair, mirrorless camera, like any, any camera that chips with like eight K or six and a half K they're also doing that, but at least like there's other benefits (laughs) to it as well. Now, now you want to get my Xiaomi, you want to get my attention, put a Foveon sensor 
in their phone. It'll be slow. It'll overheat immediately. Yep. It'll be completely impractical. I can't edit the raw files, but I will love you and I will buy that phone. But, I will drive that, to China. That one picture you take is going to be amazing. The colors are going to be oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, if you want to run down every single day of just the tech headlines, we've got just the thing for you. You can check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines. All the essential tech news in about five minutes, Daily Tech Headlines. This month, we saw a bunch of major firmware updates from cameras that added some significant features. Panasonic's GH6 added ProRes RAW output over HDMI and the ability to internally record 4K60 in ProRes 422. The Canon R3 added the ability to set a custom high-speed continuous mode, letting you define the number of shots and frame rate in that mode. It also added new high-speed recording, time-lapse, and focus stacking features. Not to be left out, the Sony FX3 added new log shooting modes, LUT importing, and timecode sync. Now, adding functionality to a camera with firmware always seems great. It's like you're getting more camera for free. But these features are so impo- if these features are so important to the camera, why didn't any of them ship with it originally? We're also increasingly seeing manufacturers announce features at launch that will come in a future firmware update. Casey over at Camera Conspiracies posted a video that Fuji's Kaizen strategy of adding continued functionality to cameras over time in firmware basically amounted to beta testing incomplete cameras on users. But it seems like every camera maker is doing it this these days so rich. It, is, is, it, is it advanced betas that we're getting on these cameras or... <laughs> Yeah, I, it really does feel like that where there's this rush to get, you know, get your thing to market as quick as possible. And listen, I, I understand these, all of these camera makers have been operating under crazy supply, supply chain constraints over the past two and a half years. Um, so that the fact that they're able to ship anything, uh, given how, like, how niche now at this point, like camera sensors and all of that stuff are like kudos for defeating that. But if you're going to delay stuff, at least fix your software first. I, I I feel like it's so, I mean, don't get me wrong. I had a Panasonic LX10 is a little, it's like an enthusiast point and shoot. It's a nice camera, one inch sensor. Hey, it was a nice camera. There were a couple things I was hoping maybe for a little bit more video support, like some HDMI out stuff. And I kept checking. They never, it's I'm still on 1.0 firmware. I'm still upset about it. Panasonic, you're dead to me. Anyway, I'm not I, I'm just kidding. But the, so like, I, I get like improve things over time, fix bugs. That's fantastic. But we are, uh, Fuji is a perfect example of this, uh, you know, to, to kind of Casey's point, uh, in his, in his video, you know, they'll put out a camera and say like, well, we're going to fix the autofocus in a future firmware update. I feel like that's an important enough thing. Like, like if you're able to substantially iterate on that, I mean, Panasonic's also famous for this. Uh, it seems like every new camera they come out with, they have a new algorithm for the depth to defocus to improve yeah. it a little bit and, and put that stuff out there. And Nikon just did this not too long ago, right after Sony and Canon had these basically majorly showed them up with their autofocus. Nikon came out with a improved version of their autofocus that didn't quite meet Canon and Nike and, uh, and Sony, but definitely vastly improved its capabilities. Yeah. And I, and I get like with, with a high end flagship camera, you probably have your four or five core use cases, right? It's like, okay, this is for the pure video shooter. Here are the features they absolutely need. So we can ship this. We need these frame rates. We need this support for, for whatever, for our hybrid, you know, for, if you're going to be using this for events and weddings and stuff like that. Okay. Here's the use cases we need for that. You're a wildlife guy, whatever. I'm sure that Every camera manufacturer has like their ideal customer and they make, sh- I would hope they would make sure to ship with that. All of these seem a little bit more ancillary. Like, I don't know if you wouldn't have bought the GH6 if you couldn't record 4K 60p at ProRes 422 right. out of the gate. Like, I don't think that's holding anyone back from buying it. But like, you know, the R3, that custom uh, high speed continuous uh, uh, thing, first of all, super cool feature. That feels like th- that. I, again, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, I know how to press the button and take the picture. Okay. But that seems like something they could have shipped with. Now, if you're going to tell me we have X amount of engineering time, if we did that, we'd have to leave out some other feature. Name the other feature you want us to leave out. I get it. Also, is it – I still think it's it's bet, – this is better than 
these are dead platforms once we release them. And if it crashes, if you're, if it wipes your card out, when you press these six things on the D pad, your SOL and oh well, buy the camera when it comes out in two years. I appreciate that we do see multi year support coming out, you know, long tail support for these, for companies that aren't receiving like a financial reward. They haven't figured out how to worm a service model onto all of my cameras right. at this point. It's the it's the announcing future firmware features at launch that really kind of makes me mad. At that point, I'm just like, wait to release, wait till it's yeah. done. Then, yeah. if it's that, if you if you're going to sell me on the promise of future features, that feels a little shady to me. I I I basically I break down firmware updates into three categories, and I'll give you an example of each one. You have the the category where they suddenly realize that through usage in the wide market in users' hands, in consumers' hands, they can accomplish something that they didn't think they could accomplish before. And I think that's where this 295 frames a second for a quarter of a second on this R3 comes into <laughs> in, Like They're like, hey, you know what? We can actually do this. This is something we can do. And there might be a market for it. Let's go ahead and throw it out there. Got it. You know, something you didn't know you could do, and now you think you can do it, and it's going to work good. Toss it out there. Cool. You gave me a feature I wasn't expecting. It wasn't something that you promised later on. It's just, hey, we figured something out you can do with your camera. Go for it. Then you have the, we thought we had it good, but we realized we had to adjust it later. For this, I'm going to give you the example of the Canon R5. A couple of updates ago, they realized through, I'm sure, not just my email, that <laughs> their their face ID or face uh, face focusing wasn't as effective on dark-skinned people. In my case, it was most of my family. Uh, some of us complained about it. They came out with a firmware update that really does improve the the camera's ability to focus on a face and identify the face on darker skinned people. They fi- they thought they had it were good. They didn't. They fixed it in firmware. All for it. Then you have the things like, oh, you should have known that this was going to be an issue, and you would you finally addressed it in form- firmware. The R5 now on the latest version can record for longer, has a new mode where it will withstand more heat before it shuts itself down in the middle of your recording. Why? These, <laughs> like you knew this was a limitation of the camera. You released the camera with this limitation that was not what anybody wanted. And then you came in later and said, oh, well, we're giving you a new mode. That should have been part of the whole thing in the very beginning. You know, you're, you're now you're delivering a promise because they were supposed to be able to record 30 minutes of video and people are getting 20 minutes and their camera was shutting off. You know, and now you're giving yeah. now you're providing them a way to accomplish what you already told them they could do. That's where it irritates me, you know. Yeah. And, and I think the maybe the analogy here are game consoles, which, again, have that longer kind of tail of support. You know, these are platforms yep. that will be supported, you know, for four or five, six years uh, down the line. And I, I do think there is an element of kind of like a game console where a lot of it is the developers figuring out how to eke out additional performance, like you were saying, with the the high, super high frame rate stuff. Uh, I feel like that's something where they're like, oh, we figured out on this whatever the DSP is or whatever they need to do to, to eke that out. That feels like something that they've had engineers working with that Silicon for uh, specifically for a long time. They figured out a way to eke that out potentially, yep. maybe, you know, it was in the pipeline or something like that. So I do realize like some of this is how can we uh, do that? I, I also understand that there is a limited financial reward for, especially when something hits like two, three years old where you're like, uh, but they're going to refresh it in a couple of years. Am I really want, you know, there is there is a fine line of keep active support adding features versus we're not gonna it's not worth our investment to do that. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's it's just don't don't make me regret buying your thing on launch day when you <laughs> when you promise me a feature that's going to drop a year later. Yeah, I, I always go into it assuming that the features they say are coming won't. Yeah, and, yeah, and ma- it's a, base it's my a nice my uh, purchasing decision on that, not on the promise of of the, the summers to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, speaking of summers to come, Kodak, it may be the summer of Kodak because they've announced that they're repurposing some of their equipment used to manufacture film for use on electric vehicle batteries as part of an investment with Wildcat Discovery Technology. 
Wildcat already manufactures EV batteries, so they're not like just getting into that business. But Kodak realized it requires similar coatings and engineering services that it already uses in STAR film-based production with minimal retooling. As part of its expansion of its advanced materials and chemical business, Kodak, Kodak has attempted to expand into pharmaceuticals and healthcare operations over the past few years as well. Uh, really, I mean, really, Kodak is a chemical company at this right. point. I mean, they've always been a chemical company that happens to still produce film. Um, it, I mean, good to see them staying relevant in what seems like it's going to be a booming industry for decades to come, right? right? And at the same time, also, it's hard enough to find film. Like, can't you just keep making more film? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I was of two minds of this because my first thought was, so they're taking these machines out of circulation of making film base uh, and and – and now there's even less machines that in this extremely specialized field to right. make film bases. But then I realized if they're able to do this and they're able to do this at scale, that also means that there's minimal retooling to move it the other way, right? To move it back to doing the coding for the film. So if they're able to expand this business, buy more, you know, like, again, these are highly specialized machines. So if they were able to buy more of them, and invest in more of them over time because they have this line of business, maybe that means – they're able to put a little bit more R and D money back into the film business. Uh, so that's, that's I, awful I, optimistic, Rich. Okay. I, I will stay optimistic. <laughs> I know they're listen. I know they're a company. Literally, it's like as soon as the ledger, the decimal point on the ledger moves a certain way, they're going to be like, "Film's dead. <laughs> Goodbye." It was nice making color <laughs> film forever, uh, but uh, I'm hoping this staves off the decimal point just for a little longer. Yeah, we're a rounding error away from losing half the stock in the world. But, um, <laughs> We would love to hear from you. If you love our stories and you want to comment on them, or if you think there's something we missed, go ahead and email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com with the subject line photo news monthly. Now, not that any, no one has, but we haven't seen any emails come in. So maybe you can be the first feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com with the subject line photo news monthly. Remember to catch Daily Tech News Show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. You can find out more about that, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll see you next month and have a super sparkly day. Aww. about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>